it's time for a recap on Friday on physiology. So, Friday physiology. If you look at the respiratory system, you can see this amazing structure with the larger airways branching off into smaller airways, just like an inverted tree. If you add up all the millions of small alveoli, the little balloons, you can conclude only one thing. The capacity is huge. One of the most interesting facts, in my opinion, is the total surface of all the alveoli combined. It's the size of a tennis court. Based on this capacity and a few other factors, it will be clear that neither ventilation nor diffusion will ever be a limiting factor, for example, during running a marathon. So whenever you hear someone say about a good marathon runner, oh, he must have huge lungs, you can say, nah, that's nonsense. We all have huge lungs. Lung capacity does not say anything about aerobic capacity, let alone marathon performance. The key message about the respiratory system is that ventilation is different from respiration. Got it? As a physio, the two most common respiratory categories, that is before the corona era, are COPD and asthma. For COPD, it's important to understand the different components that are part of this umbrella term chronic bronchitis, emphysema. For asthma, the underlying pathology is clearly different, but both COPD and asthma are obstructive diseases. And the difference between obstructive and restrictive problems is that in obstructive lung diseases, flow is impaired, while in restrictive diseases, it's the capacity that is affected. The main function of the respiratory system, especially in relation to exercise, is to bring enough oxygen into the blood so that it can travel to the active muscle tissues. The key factor in the connection between the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system is the blood, and more specifically the red blood cells that contain the amazing molecules of hemoglobin. The percentage of binding places for oxygen on hemoglobin, where oxygen is actually bound to, is what we call saturation. Visually, the saturation is expressed in a nice S-shaped curve, like this. It shows that when pressure is low, saturation drops, and if PO2 is high, saturation increases along the shape of the curve. Once you understand the normal saturation curve, it's all about one term, the Bohr effect. Bohr effect. What is this Bohr effect? During exercise, you will see local increases in PCO2, temperature 2, 3 dBg, and acidity. All of these changes have the same effect, and that is a right shift of the saturation curve, the Bohr effect. Moving on to the heart. If you're also loving these 3D augmented reality experiences of the heart, it's not too difficult to understand the anatomy of it from inside and out. If you consider the size of the heart and the internal design, it's even more impressive to see how well it operates in most people while only failing in just a minority of patients. A weak point, if you have to name one, would be its own blood supply as it receives blood from the outside and not from within. The blood supply to the heart is done through very narrow coronary arteries and only a minor obstruction could have large consequences and that's why you see so many cardiovascular patients worldwide. In a normal situation at rest, the heart would beat around 60 times a minute where blood will flow from the atria to the ventricle simply by pressure differences. Once the heart contracts, the AV valves close due to the opposite pressure difference, while semilunar valves open a bit later as ventricular pressure exceeds pressure on the outside of these valves. Measuring stroke volume is fairly difficult, while measuring heart rate is pretty simple. What's really difficult is the pronunciation of the word sphygmomanometry, the measurement of blood pressure. But once you get this, understanding the underlying physiology is actually fairly easy. The number one equation in exercise physiology is the Fick equation. It's like duct tape. You can use it for almost any problem. The Fick equation. Once you understand the underlying components of this relationship, you can start measuring and playing with those variables, such as heart rate or VO2, either in submaximal 
or maximal conditions. Although the underlying pathology and the physiological limitations are different, for athletes, respiratory or cardiac patients, the key message is the same. Exercise. Exercise versus training. Exercise is just a standalone activity, while I would define training as a systematic and planned set of exercises over a certain amount of time, like weeks or months. For the aerobic system, the standard response to an exercise at a fixed submaximal intensity is the following. Heart rate will rise, and after a few minutes, we'll find a steady state. I can see a similar graph for VO2, which indicates that the aerobic system is like a diesel engine. It takes some time to get started, but once it's running, it can maintain the same output for a relatively long amount of time. Can you name them? The key message here is to understand which variables increase during exercise compared to rest, and which variables show a chronic adaptation over time. Can you name them? Heart rate, oxygen consumption, stroke volume, arterial venous O2 difference, blood pressure. Heart rate is one of the most frequently measured variables. It's super easy with all these devices out there, but there's also misunderstandings about, for instance, maximum heart rate. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Maximum heart rate is defined by predisposition or genetics, not by training. An interesting comparison between exercise effects and training effects in the heart rate response, both during and after exercise, can be seen in this graph. The message to take home here is to understand the difference between exercise and training effects. In terms of training effects, you would expect a lower resting heart rate after months of aerobic training and a lower submaximal heart rate at any given intensity compared to pre-training. Maximum heart rate again is not affected by training and is simply set by predisposition and by aging it will only go down approximately one beat every year. That's it. I hope you get something out of it. Exercise physiology is a beautiful science and I hope I've just sparkled a little bit of inspiration onto you. For now, take care and I'll see you in the next video.